Hey, what's Jared. up, Joel? <laughs> Dude, nothing, man. Dude, what's going on? I always beat you to that. I let you beat me to it. Oh, well, thank That's you. A fact. That's a I fact. I will never, it... ever let you beat me to it. <laughs> I think I, I established that on episode maybe one or maybe episode two. Like, you could beat me to it, but it'll never be intentional. Um, I'll pretend like it's not intentional just so you can feel better. But I'll never let you know it's intentional. Yeah, no, I'm here for you. Yeah. Hey, so we were talking before this show and you said something that struck me. (laughs) (laughs) I think that I think that you do or your I don't know if you do it, but it was your ideal plan or whatever. I don't do it. And I guess ideal I can walk back on the ideal plan. It was something that I wanted to try. Okay. Is to go and buy the food I needed for the day. And then that's you know, because if I live really close to the grocery store, right? And if I wake up and I got mm-hmm. my early morning routine, you know, my my cold my cold plunges and mm-hmm. all that stuff. And then yeah. I go to the grocery store and I buy my food and I come home and then that's the food I have for that day. And then I don't spoil my vegetables. I have the right amount of portions for what I want for that day and for my family. And then I just cook it up and then the next day I do it again. Dude, why would you want to go to the grocery store that many times? I don't really mind going to the grocery store. That doesn't bother oh. me. Oh, like, okay. like... I mean, like, it's definitely like a position that I could easily be argued out of, but I just find that what we do is we grocery shop and then we end up wasting a lot of fresh food just because you got to quit doing that. Yeah. Well, I think it's just tough just because our plans just like go away where you're like, oh, this is what we're going to have for dinner. And then we forget to do something and then we can't have that for dinner or something gets weird. And then we pivot to like a simple meal. And so in my mind, if I just come home and I just have the things that I need and then I just cook it that day and then that's what I have. I already know my meat's not frozen because I just bought it, all that kind of stuff. Then you're going to go to the grocery store and you're going to be like, let's have ice cream and (laughs) cereal and (laughs) no, it would be be like thought out. It'd be like thought out. I think I could stock, I could stock breakfast. Like I could stock eggs, you know? So then I'm only going to the grocery store maybe for like, maybe lunch, maybe dinner, maybe just for dinner. Dude, I just don't know why you'd want to spend that much time traveling to the grocery store, that much time in the grocery store, seven times in the checkout stand, seven times waiting for to in line, and then seven times driving from the grocery store back to your house. When you think about about it like this, though, you could hold on from even from a health standpoint. You could plan your groceries out, okay? And then you could, which I'll get into in a second, because I have a really good (laughs) meal planning technique. It's not mine. It's my wife. She developed it. It's really good. Chat GPT, right? Um, Yeah. And you can, okay, you can drive to the grocery store once, shop for your groceries for a week, stand in line once, check out once, and then drive back to your house once. Okay, I got you. Dude, think about the time you would save. Okay, so think about this though. Like right now, I, me and my family have, you know, not the best. Uh, what would we say? Like we just get food and it spoils just because we don't use it efficiently. So for well, me to that. build up to build up a well, yeah, okay, but you've been saying that in my head for ten years and so nothing's changed, right? <laughs> so it's like for me, it's like it's not like it's not like it's like okay, Jared, for the rest of my life, every day I'm going to go to the grocery store. But for me, yeah. it could be a breaking of a habit by trying something different that yeah. puts me in a new way of thinking. That could then, okay, maybe I can go for two days because I go, man, I really don't need to go every day. I can go for two days and it's actually going to work fine. And then maybe I can become disciplined and we can get into a new rhythm where then I can go to three, four or five days to get into a new thing. To me, I think it's just more like trying something that I've never tried yep. and seeing if it actually yields a result because, you know, I'm investing more time, more effort going to the grocery store. But if my return on my investment is that I actually don't waste my food and I eat better, then to me, that's a value. That's like, that's a good return. I'll take that return. But if you just learn how to plan, like if you took the seven hours you spend going to the grocery store one week and instead learn how to plan and not waste your food, wouldn't that be better? It would be better, but some of us just have to do it the hard way to get through i mean we're pretty restrictive on our diet because my wife can't eat a whole lot but and we like we want to be healthy right so we make 
we be restrictive in order to maintain health. So don't buy junk for your house and then you can't eat it because it's not there. Right. Right. So, and I say we do this, but we don't in practice, we don't do this a hundred percent. We could still be better at it. But the idea is that you plan dinners. So we always plan a meat and a veggie and it's either going to, we're either going to have it with, well, typically we have it with rice um, or potatoes or something like that. Okay. Usually rice. My wife will do quinoa. So we, we always have rice. We always have quinoa. Um, and then we go stock up on, okay, we're going to have steaks and broccoli, or we're going to have chicken and um, baked cauliflower. Okay. We're going to have, I don't know, fish and baked cabbage, right? So, and we buy enough of it so that we can eat it for dinner and then eat it for lunch the next day. And then you're done. You buy some eggs, some sausage, some bacon, some, you know, typical breakfast items, and then you're good. Yeah. Done so. Super I easy. Mean, Pick that... seven different meats and then seven different veggies, have rice and quinoa. And number one, you're eating healthy, low sugar, low carb. Not the carbs are bad, but like breads make you fat. Um, sure. oh, whoa, easy. So you're eating healthy, all organic, you know, buy out all organic and bam, boom, bam. You got your groceries done, dude. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, it's super easy. You should try it sometime. I mean, that's pretty much what we do. Like we go and we plan out what we're going to do for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only difference is my wife doesn't like to eat leftovers as much. And so mm -hmm. that assumed leftovers for lunch the next day, I can hear her right now being like, I don't eat leftovers. Like I can hear her, her <laughs> countering me. me. Um, that was me back so, in the day. Yeah. So she's not like a big leftover person. So what typically happens is we'll make a pretty big dinner and there will be enough for leftovers, but then lunch comes around and then it's either a convenience thing where like, okay, well the timing is wrong. So let's just make this cause it's quick and then we'll do this. Um, or, you know, we just don't want to leave. I love leftovers. I don't care. I'll eat the same thing every day. That doesn't bother me. Um, yeah. The other little wrinkle is that my kids and what they have to take to school for lunch is completely different than what I would eat for lunch because it's got to be like sandwiches and cold and just different kinds of stuff. And so that's just like another uh, vector. But I hear yeah. what you're saying on the kids need to be more good. like uh, construction workers where they just eat their food cold. Yeah, or okay. they just get hot lunch at school. I mean, that's probably not the healthiest option, but that's probably the worst. Simple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What are we going to talk about today? Um, I think you were telling me about a call that you had where you had this guy who wanted to sign up for private coaching. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. He, but he, wasn't, he wasn't established. He didn't have a license yet or anything. But he understood that for him to be successful, he was like, I need yep. a coach. Like, I love what you said that his friend had a really hilarious quote to me. And he said, it's 2023. You just, you just get a coach and do it. And I, that's so funny yeah. to me because that's, that's yeah. like such a transparent, like sim simple view of the reality of what we do right now in business. Yeah, he was, like, he was like, yeah, I was talking to this guy and he went and worked for another plumbing company for 11 years. And he was like, dude, I don't, that's a long time. I don't want to put in 11 years. And when he first said that, I'm like, well, I mean, you got to put in the work to know the stuff, you know? And then he goes, so I asked my, my other buddy and he was like, dude, it's 2023. Just go find somebody that knows how to do it. And I was like, man, you know, <laughs> that's totally true. hundred yeah. percent. Like I have another client that I'm coaching right now. Neither of them are plumbers, but they inherited this plumbing business. Oh, interesting. They're going to do just fine. They didn't put in 11 years, but they were smart enough to go find somebody that knew how to do what they wanted to do. Right. It's pretty, pretty good way to go. Uh, but yeah. so like with this, with this guy we were just talking about, he was so new at it that he wasn't quite ready for coaching. Right. Um, and so he was confused about like, what are the, his first steps forward? Like, how does he actually like start a plumbing company? And um, I think like a lot of my clients that I do end up bringing on, we end up having to go back and fix these little pieces that they didn't put in place from the beginning 
when they first started that they probably should have. And so it to anybody who's listening to this who maybe wants to start, just started, or maybe they started, you know, they're a ways in, but they're not like up to full speed. Um, they could probably get a lot of value out of knowing like the steps that need to be taken in order to basically build the foundation for a successful plumbing company. Yeah, that definitely makes sense to start it with an idea of like a structure instead of just going in there and sort of like we've already talked about and just starting with the plumbing. And that's exactly. all you got. And you kind of, and you're kind of making it up as you go. Like exactly. That sounds like you're, I mean, really that sounds like something where you're just going to be building bad habits. Like you go into the yeah. gym and you say, I don't really know how to work out, but I'm just going to start doing stuff and seeing what happens. <laughs> like you're probably yeah. going to need to hire a trainer and the trainer is going to be like, dude, I, what are you doing this? What does this do? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. And then like, if you build that strong foundation, like you have the main foundation done, then when you go to hire a coach or you go to add in other pieces of it, it all just works so much better. Yeah, especially because the the strong foundation can predict the pieces that you're going to need later. So you yeah. already you already build spots for those pieces to fall into so that when you need them, you're already ready for it. You're not having yep. to make space in your organization or in your head for it. Yeah, yeah. So I have eight steps that people need to follow. Um, and I did a YouTube video about it, but it'd be cool if we could go in like, maybe a little more detail here on some of them and just get your insights because you've never started a plumbing company. So no. you might have questions that some of these other guys have. Okay. Sounds good. I'm ready, dude. I'm okay. ready. What do you want to know? Attentive. What do you want to well, know? Give me the, give me the steps. Like well, what are you, you're going to start a plumbing business. Yeah. I'm going to start a plumbing business, Jared, okay. but I don't know where to start. What, where should I start? Like I'm not okay. fresh off the street, you know, I got nothing. What do I do? So let's assume you've been in the plumbing trade for a while. Okay. So you know the plumbing. Okay. So I know the plumbing. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do two examples. Cause maybe there's an example of like, if you know the it's plumbing, the, and if you don't know the plumbing, it's the same. Okay. It's the same. It depends on where you live. Like some States, you're not going to be able mm. to go start a business unless you've been through like a certified apprenticeship program and have a plumbing license and all that good stuff. Sure. Other states, it's a little different. So that's like basically step number one is you want to go apply for the proper licensing. Okay. So, and it, like I said, it differs from state to state. Um, some states you do county licensing. Some states you do state licensing. Mm -hmm. Some states have both. Like for Alaska, um, where my business is. So we have to go get our um, journeyman certificate of fitness, which is basically your plumbing license. Mm -hmm. And the way that works is you have to go through an approved apprenticeship program that's five years long, and then you can get your journeyman certificate of fitness. So you're going to gotcha. have the experience, right? Yeah. And then after that, like after four years of having that license, so nine years in, then you can go apply for your mechanical administrator license. Okay. And then once you have your mechanical administrator license, you can go apply for your mechanical contractor license. And then you can get an Alaska business license. So there's, quite a, there's quite a few steps there just in Alaska. And I know a lot yeah. of them are similar or slightly different. Some of them have master plumber license. Um, like ours is our master plumbers are all city based. So like in Fairbanks, I have to have a master plumber license in order to pull city permits. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So gotcha. moral of the story is like, go get the right license, right? So go on, yeah. go on your state's website, um, go to the licensing section and just go start reading on what you need to actually open up a plumbing business. What kind of licensing you actually need. Gotcha. The other, the other thing you can do is you can go hire a lawyer. Like if you've got it in your budget, mm -hmm. you can, you can go hire a lawyer to set all that stuff up for you. That's what I did for my first business because I had no idea. It was like, I don't know, it's probably like three grand to have it done from a lawyer. But it was kind of nice. Like they set up the LLC, um, sure. all the stuff with the IRS, all that kind of stuff. The Alaska business license helped us get the mechanical administrator license, all that stuff. So gotcha. you, can go talk, you can go talk to a lawyer as well. Most lawyers will even know like, 
like what the steps are, or at least can help you find out where the steps are. So you might have to pay them like a couple hundred bucks and they'll give you like outline it for you. Here's the steps mm-hmm. you need to follow. Here's the forms you need to fill out, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So if it, like some states, it's going to be way confusing. So it might be easier just to mm-hmm. go to a lawyer. Like if you can't figure it out clearly on their website, it might be easier just to go to a lawyer and say, what are the steps I need to become a plumber or to get my plumbing license and ultimately open my own plumbing shop. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. The lawyer app definitely sounds like for me, since I'm the one doing this, that would sound yeah. like the way that I would go. Like yeah, that sounds you, like a really worthy investment of three grand or whatever it is. Yeah. If you've never done it before. And again, it just depends on your budget. If you got the yeah. three grand to spend then great. If you don't, then you better go figure it out. Right. Is there an amount of money you would recommend people to begin this with? Like maybe you could give me like the, the minimal amount to like the optimal amount. I mean, ideally if you could just pay for everything and have, you know, if you could have 20 grand, that'd be great. But reality is most people don't. So, sure. I mean, when I started, I didn't have any money. I put it all on a credit card. Sure. So I think I went and bought, I knew how to set up all my licensing and stuff. So that was free or whatever the cost of the license was, a couple hundred bucks. Um, And then went and bought tools. I had just enough money for a down payment on a van. Mm. So I think I put like nine grand on my credit card in between tools and the parts and the stuff in the van and the licensing and whatever other fees I had. Okay. And then, gotcha. but then, I mean, then got to work and paid it off in the first month or so. Sure. Yeah. So once you get your licensing in place, so you figured all that out, you've got your licensing in place, or once it's in the works, then you need to go to the IRS website and you need to apply for an EIN number. Right. That's your employer identification number. You've done this before, correct? Yep. Multiple yep. times. Yep. And so you can pay people to do that for you, but it's, extremely simple if you just yeah. look up your look go to irs apply for an ein number it's literally a couple steps you get an ein number you're good to go and all that does is it allows the irs to like track your tax payments and it's the number you use like to communicate with the irs that number is tied to your business and all your taxes and stuff like that are tied to it as well and correct me if I'm wrong, but you need that to set up a business bank account, right? Um, if it's an LLC, yes, you'll need an EIN number. So, so when you go to like make your business license, you can do sole proprietorship sure. or you can do LLC or you can do a corporation. Um, I would recommend just doing an LLC. It's a little bit more difficult to set up in the very beginning, um, but probably worth it because eventually... Like if you're serious about growing your business, you're going to want it to be an LLC at some point. And the cost is the same. It's just a couple more pieces of paperwork. Um, So you might as well just set it up from the get go. I noticed that when, when I, cause I've gotten an EIN just as you say from the IRS website and that took like, that took forever. That took like a week. But I noticed that when I use a company like rush filing or somebody, I get it Mm -hmm. that day. Like I've gotten, I've gotten an EIN number like two hours. Yeah. I was like, whoa, all right, we're already kicking. Um, it did cost me more, uh, True. but it, like, again, it depends on how fast you want to move and what you want to do. But yep. I think, I think for me, and I think I filed in a different state, it cost me like 400 bucks, but yep. it was the same day, like same day stuff. Like I could have then been like, all right, go to the bank, you know, and I could have just set up my stuff right then and there. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So it depends on time frame, budget, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. And then but like at that point, you have all the licensing that you need. You have all the paperwork done and then you can go get a bank account, right? In your business name. So it's going to be in your name and your business name. That way you have a place where funds can go. And you're probably going to have to put some money in there to set it up. And if you have to, I would recommend getting a checking account and having some checks because for some reason, we still pay things with tax, <laughs> as dumb as it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you recommend? Do you recommend starting? Uh, like, can I open up a bank account and like, like, if I want to use a big bank, like in Alaska, I don't have access to all the big banks. 
if I want to use a big bank, is it okay if I use a bank out, outside of state? Um, I don't know. I know like all the banks I've ever gone to go set up bank accounts with, I had to be in person to set up business accounts. That is true. I ran into that problem with Chase because I wanted to open a business account at Chase, but we don't have a Chase yeah. up here. And I yep. was like, I, you know, I don't have one in my state. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I don't have one in my state. And she's like, yeah. oh, well, sorry. Um, do you notice since, you know, you're in Florida and your business is in Alaska, is there any mm -hmm. tension between you and the bank? Because there's that distance or does there? No, no there's not because everything's pretty much online. But it, like at the same time, if I wanted to go open a new account or do anything that requires me to be in person, then I have to fly all the way to Alaska yeah. and make that happen. So that's kind of like. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. But it is, I mean, it is what it is. Hopefully, if yeah. you're starting a plumbing business, you're going to be there for a little bit at least, right? Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're in a place where if you wanted to choose one of the bigger banks, because, you know, if you open up at a Chase and then you're like, oh, I need to go do something at a different Chase, you could probably do all the things you needed to do. Yeah. And one thing, like what's cool about Chase, if you have a Chase, is they have really good rewards just with their banking mm -hmm. as well. Um, one thing I would make sure of when you're, getting a bank account, I would ask if you can, I would make sure that you have the ability to log into one online portal and view multiple business accounts and transfer between the accounts without any limits or fees. Because ultimately, you're going to want more than just one bank account for your business. You're going to want to be able to split your money into different bank accounts to get a better idea of how your business is functioning. This is going to be way further on down the road, but if you're set up at a bank that doesn't allow that, then you got to go move mm -hmm. banks. And a lot of times if you've set up in your software to have it deposited in this bank or, and you know, an automatic payments coming out of this bank, then that can get tricky moving everything over. So if you can make sure of that, like right off the get go, just ask the, when you're setting up a bank account, Hey, can I, can I do multiple accounts under one online login? And can I transfer between those accounts without fees or limits? That's a really good point. I'm actually writing that down because yeah. that's something I didn't think about, but I that could totally trip you up. Cause I've been in situations like just with my own personal bank where like I try to yeah. transfer from like savings to checkings and they're like, oh, yeah. you already exceeded your monthly limit. And I'm like, wait. Yeah my monthly limit like that doesn't yeah. make any sense like that screwed me up years ago when i was trying like a new money strategy and like yep. using a savings account and now i'm like screw it like i don't even care like yeah everything I'm goes just, in the checking it's all in the checkings now if i can't yeah. access my money when i want it like whenever i don't want to use that feature because that's stupid yeah and like later on in your business you're going to want like different different accounts for like you know setting aside money for taxes setting aside money for maybe like bonuses for your guys or, you know, an owner compensation account. Um, I would recommend everybody read profit first for contractors and set up their accounts that way. That way they're, um, you know, you're, you're pulling the profit out first. So you're making sure your business is profitable first. Um, doesn't really make sense right off the bat. So, you know, maybe a few months in, you might want to go set up these accounts, but you could read the book at any point in time and then just know that eventually it's going to be a good idea to set up your accounts that way. Gotcha. Yeah. Profit first yeah. for contractors. Yep. Yep. It's a really good book. Okay. So that's, so step one is get your licensing and get your EIN numbers that all bundle into step one. Licensing, EIN, bank account. Gotcha. Like, then you're a legit business in the eyes of the government okay cool. and you have a way to and you have some place to put your money when you make it makes sense i have a question yeah it makes sense i have a question about uh tax filing maybe you know it maybe you don't did you yeah. ever run into the problem where you would set up all these things and then you would be asked to file quarterly taxes oh yeah all the time yeah did you how do you get out of that um you don't have to pay quarterly taxes like what you're, but they ask you to they like bug you about it who does whoever in my experience i'm always bugged like because quarterly taxes and like hey your quarterly taxes are due and like whenever i'm like can i not do this they're like nope sorry and it's just always frustrating to me because every 
you know, three months, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to like go in and do something. It's like nerve wracking. Yeah. No, you don't have to do it. It's your quarterly income tax and you don't have to pay that. The only, the only taxes you might have to pay quarterly is like your, um, your employee portion of those taxes. So like state of Alaska, we have a 2.5% employee tax. The employer pays those have to get paid quarterly. Um, so you might have some of those, but like your bookkeeper and stuff is going to know that. Um, but like taxes to the IRS, they want you to pay them quarterly. So in their rules, they say, yes, you need to pay them quarterly. Um, but if you don't, it's just a fee at the end of the year. So gotcha. it might cost you like 200 bucks to not pay your taxes quarterly. And the thing is, is like for you to know how much to pay quarterly, you need to hire not just a bookkeeper, you need to hire a CPA and they'll tell you what your quarterly tax payment should be. And it's going to cost you more than the fees at the end of the year. Gotcha. So I just wouldn't do it. I've never paid them. To this day, I don't pay them. <laughs> We do five million a year in revenue and I don't pay them. I just set the money aside in an account. <laughs> and I calculate myself how much I think I'm gonna pay in taxes. Because I I know my business best. Like I know what my future plans are. I know the equipment I'm gonna purchase. So I calculate it all myself. And I think probably everybody should do that because you're gonna be way more accurate. And then you have that money there, right? Right. Like if you had to use it, you could use it and then do a payment plan with the IRS rather than giving the IRS all your money and then having to pull out a loan or something. Yeah, just that's seems, smart. It seems yeah, way smarter to hold the money yourself so you have control of it instead of give somebody else control over it. I would, I would and, then, and then when the government like, you know, leverages their terms on you, then you can negotiate like, oh, well, I'll just pay you this instead yeah. of being like, Oh, I gave them all my money, so now I can't reinvest it in my business because yep. I paid the government when I didn't need to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously you like in an ideal world, you would set aside that tax money and then pay your taxes at the end of the year with it. Um, but if something happened, you know, you have that like backup plan. Oh crap. Yeah. Like COVID happened, right? Okay, let me sure. get on a let me get on a payment plan with the IRS for my taxes and use this to maintain my payroll. So my business doesn't disappear. That would obviously right. be, be a better option, right? Right. Yeah. That's a good thing to know. Cause I bet you there's a lot of people, cause I was one of them until you just said that really, like, no, you got to do it. Like the government says you got to do it. You got to do it. Not yep. really understanding that like, yes, you will do it in one way or the other, but like there's still some room in there for you to, do something autonomously outside the government. Like the government's going to get theirs at the end of the day. But like you say, when COVID happens, there might be a better choice for you and the survival of your business and your employees and everything to, yep. you know, d delay or something. Mm -hmm. But little disclaimer, I am not a tax specialist. So whatever you do, make sure you discuss it with whoever is preparing your taxes, your CPA, like go to them, ask them. Do I have to pay this? And they might say yes. And you say, what happens if I don't pay it? And they'll give you their spiel. And then you make your own decision on whether you think it's a good idea to pay it or not pay it. Don't, yeah, just, that take, kinda, don't just take my word for it. And that tags into like knowing your business best. Yeah, obviously we're not, yeah. well, maybe not obviously, mm -hmm. but we're not CPAs or anything or can give that specific advice. But the idea of knowing your business best comes when you're talking to the people you hire, like your CPA. Yep. Yeah. Like you know your business well. And so you come to them and ask their opinion and what they know. And then you ultimately make the decision on what to do with that information. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep moving. Cause like in the beginning, you're not going to have to worry about any of that really. Like sure. you're not going to worry about making quarterly tax payments until you're at least three months in and you've made some money. So sure. So you've got your licensing all set up. Um, you set up an LLC and you opened up a bank account. You've got your EIN, all that good stuff. You're legit as far as paperwork goes. Um, there's going to be some bonding and insurance that you're going to have to get in that as well. Like before you can actually get a business license, usually you have to go get bonding and insurance. Just find an insurance broker in your area, call them up. Tell them I need the minimum bonding and insurance for a plumbing company. They'll hook you up. It's that easy. Gotcha. You have like, it's kind of weird that you have to do that and you have to tell them your name and everything before you actually go get your license. 
but that's how it works. Hmm. Cause the state wants to see that you're, you're insured and you're bonded. Then they'll give you your license. Then that's you can go to the bank. The bank wants to see your license, your bonding and your insurance and your EIN. Then you can open an account. Makes sense. Gotcha. Yep. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so step two would be come up with a name. Obviously you're going to have to come up with a name to get your business license. But when you're thinking of a name, um, you need, like, if you can start with a good name, it prevents you from having to change it in the future. Yeah. So like the question becomes what makes a good name, right? Yep. Yeah. So obviously your name, just your name. Well, that's what most people do. And that's a terrible idea. Like, Joel's well, come on. Yeah, it's, plumbing got a, and heating. it's got a good ring to it, you know, good Kate. Yeah. JP plumbing and heating. My first business was J and J mechanical. It was terrible. Oh, J and J, J, and J I mechanical. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that was your first name. It's J and J mechanical. Even my first one, J rod or second one, J rods plumbing and heating. That was terrible. Um, so when you're coming up with a name, like you want to think about something, if you're, if you're going to stay local, or if you're going to stay in the same state, even you want to come up with a name that kind of rings with the area that like fits. Mm. So like, for example, my plumbing company is in Fairbanks, Alaska, right? Fairbanks, Alaska is a gold mine town. Our, our little monument in the middle of the city is Pedro, the gold miner. <laughs> um, so it makes, it made sense to be prospector plumbing and heating, right? We're, yeah. We got prospectors and there's a couple other businesses, but not a ton of them named prospector. So it already was a name that was used in the community. It was recognizable. Somebody that saw it would, would know this is a local company for the most part. Right. 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 So then if you think like, okay, I want to go, you know, I want to take this brand like national, right. Well, then thinking of a local name maybe isn't the best fit. You want to think of some sort of name that you could take nationally. Um, and usually they have something to do with like the service or the quality of the service. So like, um, like full speed plumbing, for example, right? They're in Washington. Um, that's a name you could take all over the United States. Right. Um, they get to you quickly. That's why they're called full speed, right? They're fast at getting to you. Right. Um, you've got, um, what's another good one like that that you could do nationally. There's like Gettle air conditioning, right? Gettle. It means nothing. So right. they could go, they could go anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. Um, another good one, absolute air in California. You could take that mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, it's absolutely really good service. Right. That's how, that's how they position sure. it. So those sure. kinds of names you could take anywhere. And those are the kind of names you want to shoot for. Either one that's local, if you want to stay local, if you really want to go giant national plumbing company, well, then set yourself up from the beginning, make your name national giant plumbing company and stick with it. <laughs> stick with it's it. It's a good name. One, right? It's a good name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So come up with a name, right? That's going to be like step two. Step two is going to be like in the middle of step one somewhere. You're going to have to come up with a name to get a business license. You can kind of do all these things like at the same time. <laughs> You're doing all these things yeah. in tandem. Yeah. Most, a lot of them. Yeah. For the most part. So then step three is you're going to need to get a logo, right? So you're starting a plumbing business. You've got a good name. Then you need to get a logo. And when you're getting a logo, this is like your chance to set yourself apart, right? So we see this all the time. Um, we see guys that run around with white vans with just j and j mechanical on them or <laughs> you know just this tiny little logo on the side of their van and it just looks like every other van out there yep. so so this is your chance to like create something unique stand out in the community you want to use colors that aren't normally used you want to be you know you want your whole van wrapped um i i like brands that don't just have a name they have a, like a character like a mascot sure. those sure. seem to do the best because it's more recognizable so if you're going to get a logo probably the best place to go for plumbing businesses would be kick charge creative right sure they do some of the best logos like just go to, to their website google kick charge creative 
and go look at their brands. They're amazing. And that is going to set you up. Like if you can do that, if you can afford that, that's going to be huge for you. It's going to be night and day difference between bad yeah. logo and good logo. Um, if you yeah, don't have, that, go ahead. That's definitely something that people shouldn't sleep on as the kids say, cause oh, yeah. that's like, cause, cause people miss it all the time. Like we, you know, you just said, but like you see it all the time. Everybody starts a company and they just have like minimal logos, minimal branding. And it's cause they're not thinking like, they're not thinking big enough. And I'm not even talking about right. like national. They're just not thinking like in their town big enough. Yeah. They're just, yep. again, they're thinking about what do I need to do to do the job? Oh, I need a van to do the job. I need tools to do the job. Okay, that's good enough. Let's go. And they're scared. Like they're scared to be different and stand out and have different colors sure. and different logos. They're scared of it because nobody else is doing it, right? And that's kind of cool about the power of a brand is it kind of holds you to your own expectations, right? Yep. Because yeah. if your brand is big and loud and you say you're awesome, well, man, you better be awesome or else it's going to be really obvious when you are rolling around and you're not awesome. Because yep. people are going to exactly. be like, there's that guy who sucks, you know? Yep. Yep, exactly. So the other, like the other thing people kind of, you know, kick charge isn't cheap. Um, and you have to view it as an investment into your business. I mean, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. But if you have the money or you can find the money or you can get the money, um, then a good way to, you know, kick charge, a good way to think about it is like as an investment. Because whatever it costs, if it's five grand, 10 grand, 15 grand, I don't even know. But whatever it is, it's worth far more than that. Yeah. And the people who aren't willing to spend the money on it are the people who don't understand the value of it. Right. And, and the value of it is astronomical. You will make that money back hands down, probably more than a thousand fold easily. It's, it's a huge difference between a bad brand and a good brand. For sure. So yeah, definitely. So like just spend the money on it. Like this is one of the things where if you don't have the money, you should go get the money. Yeah, because you're gonna do it eventually. That's the thing. It's like you're gonna yeah. rebrand, and like rebranding yeah, is a hard, it's a hard thing to do. And like, I mean, really, it's like when you have a brand, whatever it is, even if it's white van with J and J Mechanical on it, mm. you are starting a clock, a branding yep. clock that's gonna yep. be like adding to it over time. And then when you rebrand, you reset it. Maybe not all the way to zero, but you definitely it definitely puts you back. Oh yeah. It might even go to zero. And then you have to oh, sort yeah. of reintroduce people and they're gonna ask you all these questions. Like I know with you would be like, where's J Rod? Like, well, yeah. this isn't J Rod's, this is Prospector. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah. well, are they the same? And you just have like these weird like things. So if you can just like start off strong with a good brand, oh my gosh. Yep. Like and I think yeah. there's there's a there's there has to be, I'm just sort of guessing here, but I feel like there is a psychological component that when you again create a strong, powerful brand, you are then like, wow, I'm doing it. I'm serious about this business. This isn't yep. something I can just quit now because I have exactly. this van, it's wrapped. I have this uniform I created. I'm like, there's a lot more to this than just like me showing up in my car hearts in my truck and like yep. going to work on your house. Like it's, exactly it's, a, it. it's a professional level that you are now switched into. Yep. hundred percent. So all that said, if you don't have the money, go find the money. Right. Yeah. Like, I like to think of it this way. Like if I was to come to you and be like, Hey dude, um, I have this Ferrari. I'll sell it to you for 3000 bucks. What's a Ferrari worth? Like a hundred grand. Yeah. More than 3000. <laughs> yeah, way more than 3000. Probably worth more than a hundred. I don't know. Yeah. But if I came to you and I was like, dude, three grand, I'll sell you this Ferrari, but you didn't have three grand. What would you do? Would you I just would go say, get, I'd get three grand. Like, yeah. You go find three grand, right? That's what kick charge is like. Kick charge is yeah. like a Ferrari for three grand. Right. Yeah. So that's a really, whatever, that's a good example. Yeah. What, whatever you got to do to get the three grand or whatever it costs to get a good brand, do it. Um, but on the other hand, like if you absolutely cannot get the money for it and you can't figure out how to do it, you can always go to 99 designs get a logo made up for like for anywhere from $99 to two grand, you can get a logo made up. Um, it's not going to be as good as kick charge. You're not going to get a van wrap with it. It's just going to be a logo, but it's going to be better than nothing. 
Right. Just know that at some point in time, you're going to want to rebrand with kick charge in order to get a good quality brand going. Right. But that is an option. <clears throat> Excuse me. But really get the, yeah, get the money and just do it right the first time. Like it's, yeah. Go ask your mom for money. Go ask your dad for money. Go ask your grandma yeah. for money. Something. Just stand, panhandle. He'd talk about that sometimes, you know. Like, yeah, go pan, need, don't need, do need money. Need money for branding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gonna be really might, good plumber. <laughs> it might work. You could probably. I mean, I think you could go ask grandma or grandpa or some people are against that. But like, if if grandma or grandpa invested money into you to go get your branding done, and then your plumbing company took off, and you were able to pay them back threefold, that'd feel pretty good. I'd yeah, be proud I of need, that. And even like just like normal investments, like if you have friends and you can you can leverage that deal and be like, hey, give me a thousand bucks and then yeah. I will give you a return on this investment. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you two back in a year. Yep. Yeah. There Heck you go. Yeah. OK, so you've got your licensing, you've got all that good stuff. You've got your name, you've got your logo. Next step is MVP. Do you know what MVP is? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> so MVP is minimum viable product. So this is true with any business you start, right? So like with a plumbing business, you're in the product of selling plumbing services. So you need to be able to go fulfill on mm -hmm. plumbing services. Okay. So you need the things that it takes to be able to fulfill that. So you're going to need a vehicle, some sort of vehicle that you can haul your tools and stuff around. You're going to need the tools. You're going to need the minimum amounts of equipment. You're going to need a phone so you can answer calls. And then you're going to need a way to write invoices and take payment. Um, you could like only take checks and write invoices on paper, but like you can go get jobber for like, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks a month. And then you can take credit cards. And then that money can get automatically deposited into the bank account that you just created. You can create invoices online, track your customers, all that good stuff right on Jobber for super cheap. So you can do the same thing on QuickBooks online too. And it's like- Is there, any, is there any software that's like a good start that can easily pipeline into a bigger CRM later or a different software later? So like- Yeah, I mean- Either of those, like QuickBooks or Jobber, you'll be able to take your customer list and 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 all your transaction data and put them into Service Titan. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to think about because if you just go and grab like some random thing that performs the same service, but then mm -hmm. it doesn't actually link up to something later because it's just like I don't know third party or kind of ghetto. Yeah. And yeah. like don't yeah don't just grab any of them. Like do a little research down the road so that when you need to upgrade, it's an easy process for you. Yeah, at a minimum, I would want to be able to take my customer list over to Service Titan. So as long as you can download your customer list, then you should be good. But I know cool. like QuickBooks, Jobber, they'll both they'll both transfer over to Service Titan. We we went from cool. QuickBooks to Service Titan. It was no big deal. Cool. Yeah. So now you can now you've got licensing name, logo, you've got a vehicle, you've got all the tools, you're ready to fulfill on your service. What's the next thing that you need? Um, I mean, you got your truck, you got your tools. Do you need some yep. customers? Customers, right? How do you get customers? Um, knocking on doors. <laughs> you could do that if you have time for that. Um, you need to do some marketing, right? Definitely got to do some marketing. Yeah. So there's like a few things that you need set up. Um, I would hire a marketing company because you're going to need a website in order to rank on Google. You're going to need a GMB profile, Google My Business profile. You're going to want to get GLSA going, Google Local Service Ads. Um, you're going to want Google AdWords going. And at minimum... You're going to want a Facebook and an Instagram account. Would I be out of line in saying that you, the plumbing company owner, should set all those up yourself and not allow somebody else to set them up for you in your place? 
So I would want to have ownership of all those. Like somebody could set them up, but then I would want to make sure that I had ownership. I would want right. ownership right. of my website. So like when you're hiring a marketing company, I know there's marketing companies out there that if you need to leave or switch marketing companies, they just shut you down. You don't oh, wow. own your AdWords account, your Google My Business account, your website, your GMB, all that stuff stays with the marketing company, which is criminal in my mind. Um, because if they don't do their job, like if they're not doing their job properly, then to leave them hurts you bad because all that yeah. stuff just gets wiped out. It's a terrible thing. So I would yeah. make sure like if you hire a marketing company, make sure you can take that stuff with you when you leave your website, your GMB, GLSA, all that stuff. Make sure you can take it with you. Make sure they'll would, transfer it over to your new marketing company. And I would add like, like again, going back to know your own business, I would even say, know your passwords and your login through all that stuff because yeah, like it's like just from our experience when people don't know that stuff it just makes it harder down the road but if you have yeah. all that stuff and you're pretty organized about it just like everything yep. else in your business it's just a piece of information that you need because yeah. it's a serious part of your strategy to be successful yeah get LastPass on your computer and just keep track of all your usernames and passwords in LastPass. it's a free yep. software connects yep. into google chrome use google chrome don't use anything else. <laughs> yeah, don't and use then, anything else. <laughs> and then get LastPass, and then you can just track your passwords. Super easy. So, like me personally, I would hire a marketing company. I would go, you got two options. You can hire a marketing company that's on retainer. So you pay them 3000 bucks a month or 2000 bucks a month or whatever. They start building your website, your GMB, your GLSA, all that good stuff. And then they just continue to work on your web, on your marketing every single month. And then so once they have like some of these things in place, then they can go start tackling some of these other areas that maybe you can get some marketing done in. Um, that's what I would do if you have the funds for it. If you don't have the funds for it, at least go like on Upwork, have somebody make you a website, go find some plumber, you know, some plumbing company that does really, really well, have them copy their website, make it for you with your colors and logos. Um, find somebody to help you set up your Google My Business. Find somebody to help you set up your GLSA, your Google AdWords, your Facebook and Instagram accounts. Like find somebody to at least help you get those set up because that's how you're going to get work in the door. And then as soon as you can afford a marketing company on retainer, hire them instantly. Because gotcha. that's probably the, that's the most important part. Like you can set up the company. But then if you don't have calls coming in the door, if you're not consistently doing marketing, you don't have much of a company, right? Right. You have nobody to build, nobody to serve, nobody to make money from. It's, it's not a good company. Do you think that people, they, do you think that people get into these situations where they have like two or three guys running and they're like, I don't have any work. Do you think that they got yeah. to that position because they waited too long to invest yep. in their marketing? But if they yeah. would have invested in their marketing from like close to day one as they could, if they yep. can afford it and they should afford it, then yep. maybe they won't have that problem when they get three guys going. Yep. Exactly. That yeah, there's plumbing businesses that have seven or eight guys who still don't invest in their marketing. <laughs> and they come on like really slow times and it's really challenging for them. And if they would just invest in their marketing and have multiple facets of marketing going they would do so much better. They would make right. so much more money, but they just don't understand that like 30 grand in on marketing for a month equals, you know, 40 or 500 grand back at the end of the month. That's right. That's how marketing works. You don't spend on the marketing. You don't do as much work. And it's, <laughs> and it, and it's a continual thing. So you have to constantly spend on marketing. You can't shut it off. And basically, yeah. at some point in time, you you know, in the beginning, you just want to have these basic things set up to get your phone ringing. But over time, you're going to build out this kind of omnipresent marketing strategy to where you're everywhere. Everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows what you do. Mm -hmm. That way, when they have a problem, they know who to call. That's really what you want in the end. 
So if you're a business owner, a plumbing business owner, mm -hmm. and you don't have the money at that moment, you should at least have a really good handle on the concept that your end goal is omnipresent. Yeah, because definitely. that mindset will then put you in a really good position as you're pushing forward to say, mm -hmm. I will be everywhere on everything I can to just take those opportunities when they come, whether yep. it's billboards or TV or whatever, social yep. media, all these things that just have this big sweeping thing. Because then you're, you're, I would never say guaranteeing, but you're doing as best you can to guarantee that you'll have work come through the door. Yeah. In every area of your business, you want to dominate. And yeah. so in your marketing, you want to dominate. Yeah. Everything you do, you want to dominate. You want to do it better than anybody else. More of it, better than anybody else. You want to dominate it. So if you're sounds doing... Like, sounds like you just need a 10 exit, right? Yeah. If I mean, for real. If you're doing... Well, maybe. But like, if you're doing <laughs> Google AdWords, dominate it. Own it. Yeah. If you're, if you're doing Facebook, dominate it. Own it. If you're doing mailers dominate at least dominate a little area right depending on your size but whatever you do mm. dominate dominate that's your marketing a, dominate everything that's a good thing you just said even if it's a little area because i think yeah. like when people think of dominate they might think oh but how am i supposed to dominate my entire million population mm, yeah. area that i serve it's like well don't think about that because that's ridiculous yeah. you're not going to be able to do that right now but think about even if it's like this street like maybe you just own your one guy but this is your street you destroy the street. This is your street. Yep. And then Dude. you can move to the next one and the next one and the next one. And like, it gives you this little focus that you can do. So if you are door knocking, you have a really firm objective to wake up every day and be like, Hey, I don't have any work. I'm going to knock on every door on this street and I'm going to yep. get some work today. Dude, I, I couldn't imagine that you wouldn't get work. There is no, you probably would. There is a plumbing business in the outskirts of Chicago somewhere. I don't remember where the guy does. Uh, seven to $8 million a year in revenue off of, I want to say it was like a five mile radius around <laughs> his shop. Wow. That's crazy. Five mile radius. That's all he does. They do not go outside of that. Like they have drawn limits. They just literally don't serve anybody else. And so to dominate the marketing in that area, super cheap. You could dominate that. No problem. Yeah. It's crazy. So yeah, so you don't have to dominate like all of Phoenix or, you know, your entire city. You can dominate one zip code or one area. But yeah. Um, so then you're doing marketing, you're getting phone calls coming in the door. Then you need to get to work, start running calls yourself and start making some money. And then take yeah. that money and set it aside in your business account. And let that account grow a little bit. So take a month or two or three or four, whatever it takes to get a, a little bit of a decent nest egg going. And that way you have the money to dump back into your business. Okay. And it mitigates that risk. So if you can work one month and, and put away 10 grand, great. Now you got a 10 grand nest egg. Maybe the next month you can go work, put away another 10 grand. Maybe you didn't hire kick charge take that 10 grand and go hire kick charge. And then maybe you need to get a marketing company. Well, work one more month. Now you got another 10 grand. Go get that marketing company on retainer. All of a sudden you're going to start getting more calls, even more, even more. Right. And then it's just a matter of, of at that point, once you start having good enough call volume, it's just a matter of like adding vehicles, adding human beings, spend more on marketing, add vehicles, add humans, spend more on marketing. And then you can just grow your plumbing business from there. So moral of the story, go get to work, like do some work. Don't be afraid to get in the van, do some work, put in the hours, put some money aside and get ready to start investing back into your business. Hmm. So you're doing some work, you're making money, you're putting it aside that's when you need to go hire a bookkeeper. Right. Like as soon as you start, like keep track of all your money spending that you've spent up until you start getting to work. The second you go to a call and somebody pays you, <laughs> go hire, go hire a bookkeeper. Yeah. You could do that. You could do that before, but at minimum, second you start making any money, go hire a bookkeeper. Keep your books right. 
track all your expenses, your yeah. income, all that stuff. That way, uh, you know, it, you can pay taxes accurately. Um, yeah. and you kind of know where you're at as well. Oh, am I making money? Am I losing money? If I'm not making money, I need to be more expensive. If I'm losing money, I need to be more expensive, like a lot more expensive. <laughs> if I'm only making a little bit, I need to be more expensive. And on and on and on. Huh. And then at that point, that you're sense. out running calls, you're making money, you're putting money in the bank account. Um, and you've got a bookkeeper, you've got all your licensing, like you're a legit plumbing company at that point in time. Yeah. Now, if you're if you're serious about growing it, what do you think the next step should be? Probably hiring people. Wrong. Just like that Dang guy. That, just like that guy that on that call that I was on. So I was on this call with this guy, right? And he said, "Man, I don't need to know how. To, like, I don't need to know how this put this all together. I just need to know somebody who does, right?" Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, I would go hire a business coach. Mm because that coach is going to give you the systems that you need to be able to start putting people and vans and all that kind of stuff sure. in, right? Instead of you just having to make up all the stuff on the spot, mm -hmm. your procedures, hiring yep. practices, even all that kind of stuff. Yep. He's going to yeah. help especially, you. Yeah. Especially if you don't know what to look for when hiring somebody and then you just go out and mm -hmm. hire your cousin or something. And Yep. Yep. And he'll help you set up like your pricing, your price book, your mm. systems really help set you up for just like exponential growth. Okay. Cause they've been there. They've done that. Like they can save you all the mistakes that they made. So you don't have to make those same mistakes. Like they understand going from where you are to where you want to be because they've done it. And that's a good time to hire it too, because it's like the least risky for you as the new business uh -huh. owner, because yeah. it's only you and your bookkeeper or whatever, you know? So it's really yeah. just you. So you're not worried about other people and their lives. Uh -huh. You're just like, uh -huh. okay, well, I just got to make enough money to pay for all my bills and I can just do it how I ever I need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, if you get too far into it, you're just going to create a mess. <laughs> and then you're going to hire a coach and you're going to have to clean up all of this mess uh, versus if you just hire them, like the second you've got the base plumbing company going, you're making a tiny little bit of money, bam, hop on a coach. And then you avoid this giant mess. The, all these things that you put in place that are dumb, that don't work. And then having to go back and like undo and then do the right thing. You just do the right yeah. thing from the beginning. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that we are probably in a more unique time where that is such a possibility now more than ever, mm -hmm. where forever people would just go and hire somebody like I suggested, and then they just start going down a weird path. They never yep. know how to fix it, where now you can go and get somebody who's been there exactly, and just yeah. really streamline your success. Mm -hmm. Yep. So those are like those steps. Those are the exact steps that I took. Like hundred percent. It's exactly what I did. And I think I worked for, like, I got all that stuff set up and then I hired a coach before I even really started running calls. Um, and then started running calls. I worked for like three months, maybe put some cash aside and then it was grow, 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 grow. It was wild. Two years later, <laughs> now two years later, $5 million a year in revenue and living in Florida. It's, it's not, I mean, so I guess I, t I say that cause I want people to think it's possible, right? Yeah. It's, it's doable. Cause I'm not like super business owner or super plumber or super smart or super talented in anything. So it's hundred percent doable. Like if you just set it up from the get go to have this yeah. base, right. And then you can invest in your business and in marketing and coaching, then it's 100% doable. What I'm learning just through so many different areas is that like quality inputs are so important. If you mm -hmm. have quality inputs, your outputs are probably going to be good. 
Yeah. Um, because then the variable is you, you become the variable. And yeah. I don't know about everybody else, but I would like to be the <clears throat> variable because I have a much better handle on myself yeah. than I do on other variables. Yeah. You can so, control yourself. Yeah. So if I have really good mm -hmm. inputs, like if I have a coach who says, do all these things, I can go, yes, coach. Now I'm the variable. Now I make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's the other weird thing about growing a plumbing company is it requires a lot of like personal growth. Like you have to become the kind of person that can own a, a decent sized plumbing company. Um, and it's almost more personal growth than anything else. It's really weird. It's a weird thing that happens and you don't really realize it until you're done or you're, you know, into it and you're like, hmm. like the actual business part of it isn't hard. It was really just, I had to mature and grow oh, man. and gain these skills and turn into the kind of person that it needed to be, to be able to have this thing that makes me all this money. So, and I think probably the only way you can get like, you can't develop those skills or that mindset or you know, the, the character traits that you need without just jumping in and doing the work. I don't think you're going to get there beforehand. I think it's something that you have to learn by doing. And I think you're going to learn way faster by doing like, maybe you can go read it in books and try to figure it out, but it's going to be, you're not gonna have anything to apply it to. It's going to be confusing. And if you can just force yourself just to go in and do, then you're going to learn it way faster. Yeah. So oh, for sure, go run a plumbing company, go do it, grow it to something big because it'll make you a better person and you'll yeah. make more money. You did it in two years. Two years is so short. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that it is. I think it's pretty short. Two years is really short. It went by really fast. It was crazy. Yeah. Cause it's a small amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I mean like two years investing in something for two years yeah it's a short amount of time but it's a lot at the same time it's a lot of time i mean it better be a good investment if you're going to put two years of your life into it you know what i mean kind of but i think that two years is such a short like to me two years is like scratching the surface at a, yeah like i guess i think about time and all that I, kind of stuff i think about time differently now and I've talked about this with you before since I broke my leg. Mm. Like two years to, in like I remember when I got in my apprenticeship program, it's a five-year apprenticeship. I was like, man, five years is a long time. I, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this thing. But then the five years went by and it was quick. And now like, now if I was to go get an apprenticeship and five years later, I have this license that makes me way more money. It seems like a worthwhile investment. Sure. But then at the same time, as I get older, I have less of those five year chunks to live. So what I spend, what I invest in, I'm almost becoming more picky, right? So yeah, to think about sense. investing into something where it requires two years of my time. Now, now that I'm, I'm only 37. I'll be 38 here shortly. But I know I only have so many more of those two-year chunks left versus when I was younger, mm -hmm. I had a lot of those two-year chunks. So if I wasted it, <laughs> it didn't matter, right? But now I don't yes. want to waste them because I know I only have a limited amount left and I don't know how many I have left. Do you think, let me push back on that because I, do you think that you phrase it into like, yeah, sure, you have a limited amount left because you don't know how many, but it almost mm -hmm. sounds to me more like you just want to find the more efficient way to use it. Because if you saw a really efficient use of five years of your time, you would mm -hmm. jump on it. It's like the same example with the Ferrari that you made earlier. Like yeah. if I said, Jared, you need to do five years in this and it will make mm -hmm. you $10 million. And yeah. then you go, oh yeah, that sounds like a good thing. It's just because you're more mature and you're more you're older, you know, and you're just more mature. So you look at things a little bit differently and you're like, okay, this two years in this endeavor is stupid. So that's like, it makes it feel like a long time. But if this two years invested into this could net me this, then that's mm -hmm. a really good use of my time. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like, I don't really like the idea of thinking like, oh, I have less time. Cause to me that speaks more of like a scarcity idea where you're mm -hmm. focusing on, I have less time to do all this stuff. 
And what I think we should be focusing on is like, okay, what can I do that's going to best use the time that I do have? Exactly. And that's really what it boils down to is you have a limited amount of time. So I need to use it to the best of my ability. Right. Yeah. So yeah. like your example of five years in $10 million out. Well, when I was 20, I would have said, heck yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, maybe when I'm 45, maybe I'm already making $10 million a year. I'm going right. to be like, nah. Yeah. That's not there. Be that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because the time I have, I need to spend it in a way that's the most valuable to me. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I find myself questioning more. What is like, what is the most important thing to spend your time on? But that is like a whole nother topic. Whole like, nother topic. Talk, we could do that for a whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. So walk us through. What do we learn today? What are, okay. what are the steps? Um, you need to learn how to grocery budget. Um, nah. Don't do it like Joel. Fake, fake news. <laughs> fake news. Um, so if you want to start a plumbing company, it's a really good idea because you can make a lot of money and it can be a lot of fun. And it actually really is a good use of your time, especially if you are working as a plumber right now. Um, and so the steps are licensing, um, come up with a good name, get a logo designed, get the van, the tools and the phone and some way to take payments, go do some marketing, start running calls, put some money aside, hire a bookkeeper, hire a business coach, and then scale to the moon. And in two years time, two and a half years time, you could be doing, you know, $5 million a year in revenue. No problem. Cool. Cool, man. Cool. Thanks, Jared. Super helpful. You're welcome. What episode is this? Eight. Ocho, as they say. Episode eight in the books. See you guys. Boom. See ya.